Joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Can Are you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Happy Monday, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Happy Kevin O'Sullivan. Monday. I like that. Happy Monday. I'm Alex Phillips with you for the next half an hour to squeak through the headlines like two nudists past a wasp nest. <laughs> You're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. See these surprises we line up for each other. Your, yours is quite a things. surprise. Another brilliant start, uh, but we've got a lot to get through. Yes, This yes, is the yes. fastest 30 minutes in broadcasting, so let's get going. I mean, basically, uh, Alex, this week is the nightmare week from hell <laughs> for on. our beleaguered Prime Minister uh, Rishi Sunak. He's at the COVID inquiry mm. today. If that wasn't bad enough, uh, he's being assailed from all sides by uh, wet Tories who want him to stick with human rights and the ECHR and uh, right-wing Tories who want him to leave the ECHR. And basically, he's a coward because he hasn't got the guts to leave the ECHR. And if he doesn't do this, he will never, ever get any migrants to Rwanda at all. Uh, at least, well, that uh, might uh, be interpreted as my view, uh, <laughs> but it is also the view of former Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick, who laid out his opinions on the BBC yesterday. I respect the Prime Minister, of course I do, and our disagreement is on this issue, but it is an absolutely totemic one to the future of the Conservative Party and to the public, and I don't believe this bill will work. I think it will lead to... Uh, a, a range of legal claims which will bog down our scheme and will not create the deterrent that he and I set out to achieve. And the test for this is not can you get one or two symbolic flights off before the next election with a handful of illegal migrants on them. It's can you create a strong deterrent that is sustainable and stops the boats and protects the borders of this country for years to come. That's what I want to achieve. And I'm afraid this bill is not it. Oh, just ruin the plan. It's like someone attaching paper wings to a piglet and repeatedly throwing it off a cliff. It's <laughs> never going to work, really ever. You know, even analogy. if you have that plane taking off, there won't be migrants on it because they will all have their own individual court cases. And then, of course, who pays for that? We do. This bill, if it manages to squeak through in the House of Commons, isn't going to get through the Lords. I mean, they came up with this mad headline, didn't they? We're going to send people to Rwanda about two and a half years ago. And I went, mm, that's not going to happen, is it now? Mm. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. It will be a deterrent. A deterrent for whom? Yeah. The people traffickers aren't going to go, oh, do you know what? I better give up this very lucrative line of criminal activity because the poor people I'm taking across the channel might be sent to Rwanda. They're not going to stop doing what they do. It's just a madness. And, and the migrants will calculate, oh, hang on, this deterrent, I've got a 0.5% chance of being sent right. to Rwanda. I'll take my chances. Mm. It's not much of a deterrent, to say the least. And I never thought I'd say this. I'd become I'm a big Robert Jenrick fan uh, because he's laying out exactly the facts that what yeah. Rishi Sunak has chosen to die on this ridiculous hill. Uh, and uh, Jenrick is right that Sunak's plan is this. If I could just get one migrant to Rwanda, just one, just one on a plane, then everybody will vote for me. No, they, no, they won't. won't. And what's worse is it's uh, squeaked out today, hasn't it, that the government are putting out tenders for people to compete as part of a £700 million project to basically accommodate uh, migrants. Small boats until 2030. They're going to have some sort of away day where if you want to create medical services or fun activities yeah. or doctor surgeries for people who arrive on small boats, let's all go to Kent and figure out how we can spend public uh, money to do that. I no. Ask yourself this, Alex. Uh, uh, is laying aside £700 million uh, to manage the arrival of migrants on small boats really the language of a government that intends to stop the small boats? It isn't, is it? It really isn't. Uh, uh, now, we're still with the Rwanda scheme and back to our favourite former no. goal-hanging 
professional footballer, Gary Lineker. Hey, He's done well, it Gary. again. He's done it <laughs> again. Week. He signed a petition by a bunch of lovies who, of course, are signalling their virtue about the awfulness of the Rwanda scheme. And, of course, he's never seen a bleeding heart project that he didn't want to get involved in. To prove what a great, great guy he is, it's Gary again. And uh, people at the BBC are sick of this guy. Why can't he wind his neck in and not sign this petition? You know, I love the fact that, it's, you know, he, that this letter signed by about 30 losers is called Together with Refugees. Oh, yeah, like the Albanian criminals who are trafficking people across the channel. Oh, really? The refugees, are they? Come on, get a life. Why do these people want to shower themselves in virtue yeah. all the time? They have such egos. They don't care that the yeah. taxpayer who is struggling to make ends meet is picking up the bill. Yeah. They don't. It's not their communities being completely riven into by mass immigration. No, as long as they get to write a letter and feel very proud of themselves on a weekend, that's fine. And you Go can away, Gary. Remember, uh, imagine, if you will, uh, a sort of backbench Tory MP who's going to wants the Rwanda scheme to come into uh, effect. Imagine him going, well, I was going to vote for the Rwanda scheme, oh, yeah, but, but now Gary. that Brian Cox, Juliet Stevenson, David Morrissey and Gary Lineker and a bunch of other useless lovies have signed a petition, I've changed my mind. I don't want the Rwanda scheme anymore. What a lot. Why do these people do it? What they effect do they They've got nothing better to do. Yeah. They host, like, one television show a week for millions of pounds and then get bored. Yeah. And so they've got to find but, themselves some purpose in life. But we're re revisiting this, sir, because the real essence of this story is Gary Lineker. I mean, he can't keep doing this. All he had to do... <laughs> we wouldn't assume, Gary, that you supported the Rwanda scheme if you didn't sign this petition. So don't, what for once in your selfish life, why don't you give the BBC a chance? Because every time you do this, you damage the state broadcaster. And uh, far be it for me to stick up for Auntie Beeb, but I don't think she deserves no. your interventions like we this. We don't... As the Members of the public, we don't have to have... I mean, we don't deserve it, do we? It's not fair that no, we have we Gary Lineker inflicted upon us. Now, uh, I, I, I've been uh, looking forward to talking to you because... Oh, have you? Uh, yes, uh, in, in, so many, in so many ways. <laughs> but for this, on this topic particularly, yeah. Boris Johnson could return as Prime Minister under astonishing plans being hatched by Tory MPs with a dream ticket leadership tie-up with Nigel Farage <laughs> being considered. Now, I laughed about this yesterday. You're laughing about it now, but old Nigel, ever the player, he's gone on to telly last night, this morning, after coming third in I'm a Celebrity, a hell of a good performance, by the way, uh, and uh, was asked about this, would you tie up with uh, Boris Johnson on a dream ticket? And his reply, significantly, I thought, was never say never. But this is the game Nigel likes to I play. know he does. Like he's going to go and join those idiots in the Conservative Party. I, I, one of our earlier stories, apparently there are five right-wing factions all having their meetings yeah. today of the Rwanda plan. This is the problem with the Conservative Party. It's like some weird, dysfunctional public six form, public school sixth form debating society with their little clans and their little friendship groups and their little WhatsApp groups and I've got a plan and I'm going to bring back Boris. Bring back Boris and then the next minute someone's going to shoot him between the eyes. Stop hatching plans about your little games in politics, you know, your parlour games and, and actually run the country, why don't you? Nigel hates the Conservatives. He knows what they stand for, which is just plotting, conniving. I remember when we had a couple of Conservatives come join us in the UKIP days and he said, shouldn't have let them in. They can't help themselves. All they want to do yeah, but, is plot. I mean, I, I take your point, but, but you, you know, he's the kind of guy who could who could, because uh, he's a talented guy, he's a brilliant politician, he's the kind of guy who could turn the Conservatives back into what they're supposed but to be. I don't think. Let them have it. Let all those, uh, you know, lipid, lily-livered leftists I think, I think, have the Tories. I think you're and in And Nigel for a... can stay as president of reform, and then if you've got some metal and some backbone, and you actually want to stand up for what you believe in, like the rest of we Brexiteers, mm. get out the Tory party and join the party that actually does share your ideology. Show some metal. Yeah, indeed, and how disappointed will you be when uh, uh, Nigel Farage does become Deputy Prime Minister? I... Well, He's as, a politician, as, as, he'll as, take the money, I I'll know trust him me. better than you do. Yeah, 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 know, yeah, but, yeah. But he doesn't mind playing the game of let's sort of tear the Conservatives apart at the seams, destroy them, rubbleize them, and from the remnants yeah. that remain, rebuild something beautiful. Well, maybe. Let's see. Uh, Sunak's Christmas message is to his 
disunited party. He's saying, unite or die. <laughs> well, stop coming up with crap plans, then. How can people unite around your rubbish Rwanda bill? Why don't you sow so some guts? Stop being such a coward and leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Then we could take a plane off tomorrow, couldn't we? But this is a point, this is a problem they all have, isn't it? Like, Theresa May's half-in, half-out attempt at Brexit. Mm. You know, you with that ridiculous party, if you do something that's remotely right-wing, half the party are going to leave, because most of the people in the Conservative Party are right just wing, Lib Dems in yeah, blue jumpers. They're like not Boris. real right-wingers. Well, people like, like Boris. Boris as well. <laughs> um, and so they all find themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. If you do try and be a little bit right-wing, like Liz Truss, you're gone! Yeah. You'll only last 44 days. But, you know, you can understand why he says unite or die. It is true, but I don't think these people care. Most of them have already started lining up their jobs in the private sector when they lose their their seats, and so they just want them? to run amok. Can you blame them? Well, no, do you know what? I do blame them, because I actually think politics is a vocation and about conviction. Some of us gave up careers to stand up for what we believe well, look in. Now uh, Well, I managed to find my way back, didn't I? So, you know, <laughs> it's been all right. It's yeah, well, working then, don't out. Do, just don't make that mistake Touch again. Wood. Don't make us... Don't... Trust me, uh, you will uh, come, uh, come unstuck if you... Uh, Follow convictions. Oh, but I love the fact, who are they deploying to try and sort all of this out? Who better to send into the fray than Lord Spadeface Why himself? do they think? They, they think, uh, Rishi Sunak uh, thinks that uh, the way to quell the Rwanda rebellion, all the right-wing MPs are going to vote against him, and maybe the left-wing Tory MPs as well, who are going to vote against him because they love human rights and all that. Uh, he is the one who's going to quell this rebellion from both sides. Oh, uh, well, why are they going to listen to Lord Snooty? Why, why does he think, you know... <laughs> These are red wall MPs. They can't stand privileged young people like Mr. Cameron. Well, he's not young, not that young anymore, is but he? he was born into privilege. It does. He's got loads of money, never had to uh, live lives like the rest of us. Why does it... Sunak think that this old stooge will solve his problems? I mean, for yeah. God's sake. It is, it, it is to me quite entertaining that he's now regarded as some sort of silver yes. bullet dug up from? from his shepherd's hut to come and save the Conservative Party. I mean, you know, it's an interesting plot. Isn't it? It's an interesting scheme. I mean, I suppose to be fair to Cameron, he could claim, yes, I was a dreadful prime minister. My foreign policies were a catastrophe, almost a comedy. They were so bad, but I was a better prime minister than the current one. He could say that, couldn't well, he? Well, it's not. To be honest, Rishi's not that hard to beat. I think. Look, <laughs> I, know, I suppose that's if the we point. were going to do some sort of straight analysis on this, which isn't that much fun, but David Cameron is that sort of one foot in the blue corner, one foot in the Lib Dem corner. I mean, he had that really sickening bromance with Nick Clegg, where it looked like they were in some sort of like secret relationship in that rose garden. It's a bit. Bleh. But I suppose, arguably, he is one of those sort of, you know, conservatives that is, just has no real conservative values, so he might be able to speak to one side of the party. Yeah, uh, no, he won't. This no, won't work. It's, none of this Cameron is, is the work. worst guy to pour oil onto troubled Tory waters. Putting him in charge of quelling the rebellion is like sort of uh, saying, let's put this fire out by putting a match into the paraffin. No, but he is quite it's boring, though, isn't he? He's boring. You know, he is boring. He's boring and pretty damn useless as well. Mind you, that's the tradition. Tradition of our prime ministers lately. Uh, now, uh, talking of our prime ministers lately, mm -hmm. uh, our pri current prime minister, Sunak, he's, he's cropping up a lot today, isn't he? He's at the COVID For inquiry, uh, where, of course, the great and the good, the establishment, will grill him on eat out to help out. There's no evidence it did any harm at all, but according to the likes of Hugo Keith and Baroness Hallett, it was the disaster that killed millions of people. It didn't. Yeah, they're it gonna, didn't. They're... It was a perfectly good scheme to try and save our pubs and restaurants. Uh, let's uh, have a look. To get customers back into restaurants, cafes and pubs, and protect the 1.8 million people who work in them. I can announce today that for the month of August, we will give everyone in the country an eat out to help out discount. Meals eaten at any participating business, Monday to Wednesday, will be 50% off up to a maximum discount of 10 pounds per head for everyone, including children. Indeed, they are going to grill him and serve him like a government subsidi subsidised snack, no doubt. Apparently, uh, because of this policy, he was called Dr Death, the Chancellor, because, I don't know, he wanted to save the hospitality industry and wanted people to go and live their lives and have some food. I mean, I actually think when uh, he's up in front of uh, lead counsel Hugo Keith 
KFC. Hugo Keith. Hugo, Hugo Keith KFC. Yeah. Um, you did call Matt Hancock a nasty name, didn't you? Hey, hey. Well, uh, honestly. That's my Hugo but Keith. I, hope, I actually hope that Rishi Sunak stands there and actually says, yeah, I was a hawk and I do think that lockdowns are rubbish and I think we've rebelised the economy and thankfully I brought this scheme out because people stopped going bonkers stuck in their houses and pubs and restaurants were slightly saved. Listen, there's no evidence whatsoever that eat out to help out cause a single death or any problems at all. And uh, if you question that, think about it. There are so many countries around Europe that had worse death rates than us, than us ended up with much worse death rates than us and around the world, and none of them had eat out to help out. See what I, I mean? remember when we were See going to I mean? eat out to help out, we were sort of atomised into socially distanced tables and having to sit out on the streets of London in five degree temperatures, shivering over our hors d'oeuvres. Yeah, well, so, uh, you know, it wasn't like normal times, was it? Well, yeah, but it was a good scheme and it didn't, it kill, was. It didn't kill anyone. Defend uh, it, Rishi. Is, but the establishment hated it. Oh, you, Dr. Death, rubbish, rubbish. We'll be covering that in full later on at Crosstalk at one o'clock. Oh, I'll start with uh, now, uh, let's talk about the BBC let's. again. Uh, the Diana crazy. emails, amazing story. This I've spoken to this guy, Andy Webb. He's an author and mm. journalist, and for uh, for about three years now, he's been trying to get the BBC to hand over thousands of emails. These were the emails that were circulated fairly recently, just a few years back, between executives trying to cover up the truth of what Martin Bashir did 25 years mm. ago when he conned Princess Diana. Shame shamelessly and uh, arguably criminally conned uh, Diana into that interview. When I say criminally, obviously there were no criminal charges, but he admitted to uh, forging bank, uh, statements, bank, bank statements, yeah. forging uh, money drafts uh, to pretend to Diana that the people around him, including Charles, were selling stories to Fleet Street. Absolute yeah. nonsense. It was re it's really, I mean, it is just, it's absolutely grim to do that to anybody. It's a, it's a yeah. it's sociopathy, basically. Well, they old people are plotting against you. Here's a fake bank statement to prove that this yeah. person's selling this story yeah. and this person's tapping your phone. Making that poor woman go bonkers just so she'd sit down yeah. and do the tell-all interview with him. It is grim well, and that it's much, dark. That much we but, know. But that much is, we what know is, that, what but is these awful, executives... The execs are covering up and they have already spent about £100,000 of, of course, licence payers' money on the legal fees to try and keep this stuff hidden. Yeah, 3,200 emails between executives who were busy trying to keep the truth from B BBC licence fee payers. Uh, they've finally been told, hand these documents over to uh, Mr Webb. The judge in the case, uh, Brian Kennedy, KC, ordered BBC bosses to do this and uh, accused them of uh, dishonesty, essentially, uh, and said they were being very shifty and they needed to hand them over now. Yep. So this is the broadcaster, the state broadcaster, you paid for trying to keep dirty little secrets from you. Uh, and uh, it's not good enough. It's, it's not, not good enough. enough. No, and, and the absolute should be um, taken to task on this. And I think that story is just going to build and build. Oh, but uh, by the way, uh, the COVID era, uh, the uh, um, lockdowns Lockdown. are being blamed uh, for plunging Britain into a divided society, a polarised society, like in the Victorian era. Yeah. This is include, uh, according to a study by the Centre for Social Justice think tank, uh, and it says that the lockdowns polarised our society mm. so much that we've now got the haves and the have nots, right. just like we had in the Victorian age, and uh, they lament this situation. Well, this is totally true. This is census, census blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Centre for Social Justice is the think tank, I think, part established by uh, Sir Ian Duncan Smith. And they look very much about, you know, what's socially conservative ideas, basically. And what they've said is when you locked up the country, it was all well and good for the middle classes in their lovely four bedroom right. detached houses with big gardens and their state of the art laptops sitting there in their pajamas, still earning about 60 grand a year or being paid furlough or whatever it is to bake bread and watch telly and, you know, do Joe Wicks exercises in their living rooms. What about the people who were crammed into airless, tiny little shared accommodation, who didn't have a back garden, whose kids didn't have laptops to continue their studies, or those people who had to go out and work on the production lines in factories, lorry drivers whose service stations were shut down because of COVID, so they couldn't even have the dignity of going to the toilet to make sure with the food on supermarket shelves. It was divisive.
expensive, which is why you get so many of these KCs, <laughs> Hugo Keith KFC, standing there proselytizing about how great lockdown was. Well, it was great for you, mates, because you probably sat in the bottom of your garden in your man shed, your air conditioned man shed, in your big wing back chair, doing your little legal notes for £5,000 a minute. What about the people who suffered? What she said. Listen to the lady. Sorry, I'm just... I very, very really... good point uh, anyway. uh, at great length Ooh. there. Um, but, uh, no, uh, it is interesting. That, but you're right. Uh, it was OK for me. Uh, I've got a, quite a nice house with a garden, but I always did think about Tracy in her tower block. Uh, thank you this morning for that reference. On the 22nd floor with four kids all cooped up. Yeah. Uh, the lockdowns, uh, another disastrous effect was oh, to divide societies to this extent. Hugo Keith should think about this, but he won't. He because, won't because, like everybody in the COVID inquiry, thinks lockdowns were brilliant, absolutely yeah. faultless, nothing to criticise there. Disgraceful. They were a disaster. We should never have done it. Right, uh, talking of disasters, oh, it's <laughs> Toby. <laughs> See what he I did. A See what I did there. Uh, Omid Scobie, end Endgame uh, has been released in uh, Holland, as we know. Mm -hmm. He, uh, uh, towards the end of last week, it was Friday. He finally admitted he'd been lying about not it's putting that paragraph in about Charles and Kate being the alleged royal racist. So it was in there, and uh, apparently uh, the uh, Holland book has now had hundreds of changes made yeah. to it. Presumably, because of this, they fear that maybe a lot of it isn't true. I mean, what it what it looks like to me is, you know, there was this sort of first copy snuck out to the Dutch, uh, Dutch press, I suppose, or put on Dutch bookshelves, which completely wouldn't have been able to be published here because of laws in this country. And it, it then enabled this circulation of some of the most tawdry, horrible, spiteful, misogynistic, shameful little uh, uh, accusations, peccadilloes, you know, name calling. Um, um, and then now, of course, you know, those have had to be pulped. Oh, but not before they circulated around the world and on social media. And the new version is now out and it shows quite how many amendments have been made. But it, it does demonstrate that this guy is just a charlatan, a lying fraud. What she said. Right, let's move on. Uh, Tory peer Baroness uh, no. Michelle Moan admits error in publicly denying links to error. PPE firm. Uh, that means she lied. Yeah. Uh, basically, she's got close connections to this company uh, that were awarded a £200 million contract. They were called PPA MedPro. Her husband was deeply involved in that. Uh, she said she had no links. She denied all links to this company. And now she says uh, she has admitted in an interview in the Sunday Telegraph yesterday that she made an error in denying her links it to PPE MedPro. In other words, she lied. I mean, this is pretty grim. She's there basically saying in the middle of the pandemic, I've got a firm that can do all the contracts and provide all of this equipment and so on and so forth. You know, 200 million pound contract she got. And she said, oh no, the firm has nothing to do with me. No, it was. She knew about this firm because the minute they get the contract, basically five days, it's then incorporated um, as a company by her husband's business associates. They get the big government contract and they go, right, yeah. let's make and it our it, company. Here they go, here it goes. Come on here now. It goes. So, uh, uh, she contacted Michael Gove and fellow Tory peer the Theodore Agnew in May 2020, offering to supply PPE equipment, quotes, via my team in Hong Kong. Five days before PPE Medro was given the contract, uh, she thinks she says that her and her husband have done nothing wrong. Uh, that's uh, what she says. It's shady, Let's love. find I'm out sorry. if that's it's true. It's shady. Maybe uh, it would have been a good idea, Michelle, though, at the beginning of your campaign to clear your name, that you didn't lie about co your connections to this dodgy PPE firm. Uh, now, let's go back to our... Uh, no, I'm not going to... I was going to say our friend. He's not our friend. <laughs> let's go back to John. <laughs> Jeremy Carl, yeah, like, let's go back to friend. our regular uh, feature on this show. John Venables, the killer of Jamie yeah. uh, Bulger. We'll find out this week if the parole board has made the horrendous mistake of releasing him. But in pursuit of being let out of jail where he resides for serious paedophile offences, uh, danger to children, clearly, uh, he says he is completely rehabilitated. You're a paedophile. Paedophiles cannot be rehabilitated. I mean, apart from the, you know, absolutely atrocious, unforgettable, disgusting crime he committed, the one that he's most known for. He has twice since been jailed for possessing indecent images of children. I don't think, unless you've had an entire brain transplant and lobotomy, that you're somehow now recovered. Yeah. So, do you know what? Uh, you know... Uh...
Let's just hope that he doesn't let the parole board for once in their useless lives make the right decision and keep that guy locked up. He does not deserve to be on the streets. He's been a danger to children his entire life. When he was 10, year, 10 years old, he killed one poor little Jamie Bulger, and now he's a, an avid collector of serious paedophile pornography. If you think that kind of guy should be let out on our streets, uh, I don't. Uh, now, uh, do you like a day at the races? You know, I don't mind the... a day at the races. I like horses. Uh, Horse have races. you been to oh, Aintree? I have not. Well, uh, basically, uh, well, well, let's have a look at this. Uh, the, fun, the fun I could this have is been what having. Happened at, I don't know what to say. This is what happened at Aintree yesterday. Uh, so, uh, yes. Oh, look at that. <laughs> there you That's go. just a normal night out in Weatherspoons. What are they, are these tipsters or uh, are these people laying bets at? No, I mean, a lot of drink have been taken and this mm -hmm. massive barroom ball erupted <laughs> where everybody got involved. Ain't <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry, we, should, we shouldn't it. be laughing. We shouldn't be laughing. It looks like a load of out-of-control toddlers at Tumbleland, doesn't it? I mean, you know, they've had so much drink, they can't even actually land a punch. I mean, but um, you've got, to be honest, the look at you see now, the sort Whoa. of photographs and the races and the like, it, it does look more like some sort of mad well, it's stag do rather Aintree's than... Well, has got uh, form for this. So in fact, to be fair, all the race courses, people do now seem to go there and get kind of catatonically drunk. Mm -hmm. uh, and this sort of thing happens. Uh, I was at uh, Ascot in the summer and that sort of thing didn't happen when I was there. But uh, interesting times. Uh, now, uh, I'm a celebrity. Uh, Nigel Farage came third. He did. Sam Thompson well done, uh, came first. Uh, mm -hmm. So quite a, a time. Yeah, no, and you know, I actually quite enjoyed the last couple of episodes because I've been forcing myself to watch it for the whole three weeks or whatever interminable period it's been. It's, it's a pretty tedious show, actually. But it did start to get interesting because finally they had to stick our Nige on it, didn't they? And you actually kind of got to see that he is quite good fun and most people actually relatively got along with him. Yeah, no, it's, it's... And I think coming third is a triumph. So well done, Nigel. Oh, that, but as a caveat to that, I should uh, remind you that uh, Matt Hancock came third as well, so don't get too carried away. <laughs> That seems to be where the politicians end up. However, uh, he did do very well, and I think people liked him. And uh, that guy, Fred Seriak, who said, you're evil because of Brexit, you're evil, evil. Hey, Fred, uh, Farage represents what the majority of people in this country think, and you don't. I must admit, obviously, my fave was Nigel, my old boss and bezer, but I, I did have a soft spot for Tony Bellew. It was I a nice guy. The tone, the tone. Whereas Sam Thompson just piped down with you. Yeah, well, he, he, defines, he defines... He defines... Like really nice he defines guy. the term nice but dim. Oh, I mean, he's, the guy's 31 years old. I know. He's, he's 31 going on five. I mean, he's such a kid. He's a, uh, but, but you he, know, you know that ITV were basically grooming him, weren't they? They want to give him a big show now. Yeah, we're not going to be able to get rid of him annoying. that quickly. He's really annoying. Don't give him a show. Oh, well. Really, really annoying. Like me and sadly, Alex, we've come <laughs> to the end of the show. Yes, thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join us a bit later for our other show, Cross Talk. That's coming up at 1 pm. Up next, though, is Jake Berry standing in for Julia Hartley Brewer. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV, sitting on his fat arse.